Hello and welcome to the Forum. I'm John Matheson. Today we'll be talking about Cape Town and land, but my first guest is Anne Bernstein, director, executive director of the Centre for Development and Enterprise. Anne studied at Wits University and did postgraduate work at the University of California in Los Angeles in urban planning, came back to South Africa and worked in Parliament running Helen Sussman's research office. Uh, she founded the CDE in 1995, and she's been its executive director ever since. And welcome to the forum. Thanks, Johnny. I'm delighted to be here. And um, you've studied South Africa's progress uh, since then. Uh, how serious is the crisis, and how do you see it? I think most people are underestimating the extent of South Africa's troubles today. We have a fiscal crisis, a growth crisis, an unemployment crisis that is catastrophic, and a growing social and welfare crisis. So I don't think people appreciate how deep our troubles are and the necessity for really fundamental reforms and a change of direction. You've, you've talked about 10 million job uh, unemployment that was before COVID-19. Now it's up at least 2 million. Uh, these are, I mean, I think you've described it as the worst jobs problem in the world. Well, certainly our research shows it's the deepest unemployment crisis in the world pre-COVID. Um, there are people, there are countries that go up and down, but ours has consistently been really terrible. And the best figure, besides the, the numbers, the best think, figure to, to think about is this. In most countries, about... 60, 62% of the workforce are, in, are actually working. In South Africa, pre-COVID, we were at about 42% of the workforce. And with COVID, we're probably around 38%. We're a complete global outlier in a very, I mean, in a very bad way. So that's the best way to think about it comparatively. And uh, of course, uh, you, you point to this as the key, uh, obviously, very, very top-level problem. Uh, why is it that we've had all these job summits and they make, make no, seem to make no difference? Well, I think two decades of talking, of tweaking, of avoiding the real issues, of thinking that projects for a 1,000 people or even 10,000 people will make a difference has been demonstrated to fail. The situation just gets worse and worse. I think the government and many business leaders, in fact, are avoiding the fundamental issues. Most people want to talk about unemployment on, you know, in sort of on its own, and then they want to talk in another draw on growth. The fact is that until we get faster growth, we will not deal with the unemployment situation. So we have to make reforms to get much faster growth in South Africa over a, a extensive period. But that's not sufficient. We have to get fast, but also labor intensive growth. And that requires another set of reforms to our labor market. So in the short term, that's what we have to do. And I can spell out the reforms that are required in both. In the medium term, you can see that over the past 60, 70 years, South Africa has failed to develop a skilled workforce. And since democracy, we've had this notion influencing government policy that what we need is a high skilled and high wage approach to development. Well, that's failed. We don't have a highly skilled workforce. 
that's a fact and it's a, it's a terrible indictment of this society, but that's the reality. And what we need are jobs created in our economy for the workforce we actually have today. At the same time, we should be much more serious about how we deal with our education system, basic education, comparatively speaking, it's not that we spend too little money, it's that we get terrible value for the money we invest in basic education. So we, we need to fix that. And we also need to fix our vocational education and skills training. Again, very expensive, very ineffective, not closely enough aligned to business and the evolving needs of the modern economy. So there's lots for South Africa to do, but what happens is everyone wants to avoid these big issues. And so we have job summit after job summit, we have announcement after announcement, but all of them avoid the fundamental questions which require serious reforms and sticking with those reforms and dealing with the politics of how we get those reforms implemented. Before we go to some specific reforms, which I'm very keen to do, uh, I, I just wanted to ra raise the sort of ro the role you see for the state and, and business. Uh, you, are, you are not a libertarian. In other words, you, you're not looking for a weak state. You're looking for a strong state, as I understand you. Uh, you're simply saying we have to face the fact that the state we have isn't strong and we have to, we have to work w within those confines until we've changed it. Well, I put it this way, I don't like the words a strong state in this era of growing authoritarianism. I think we need to be careful. So let me put it this way. Developing countries need effective, capable states. They need to be professional. They need to be merit-based as much as is possible. And they need to understand how to regulate competitive markets. So I, I think I agree with the president. Rebuilding the state is absolutely vital. What we need from him are some principles of how he's going to do that and some guidelines for the longer term. And the relationship between the state and the market is absolutely fundamental for our success in the future. I, Two more points. We can't make progress in South Africa if we continue to have an attitude in the leading political party and the government that is essentially anti-business. It's a view that business is a kind of, big business is a necessary evil and somehow we have to discipline this. So one of the key differences between approaches to South Africa's recovery and growth strategy is, I think it's fair to say if you read the ANC recovery strategy and the alliance strategy and a number of others, it's, it's characterized by an approach in general that wants to discipline capital. If you look at the national treasury reforms and the business sort of approach to how to get South Africa growing again, it's looking for a state that will enable business. Um, so I am very much in favor of the enabling approach. And we are arguing and have been for a long time that if you're anti-business, you won't get growth and you won't deal with poverty. Right. Go Our ahead. Point, we have to fix the state. It's currently not everything, but in general, you could say the state is weak, corrupt, and almost broken in many sort of dimensions, far too many. So we need a medium term approach to how we fix the state. But what nobody wants to talk about is what do we do tomorrow? We know we've got all sorts of things to do to fix the economy and our society and introduce the reforms we need. How will we do that if the state is so weak and corrupt? And I think we've got to spend a lot more time now. And it's a key issue to look for when the president announces his recovery strategy tomorrow. We have to 
be assessing this again. So who will do what? Don't tell me this department will do the following things because I promise you they will not. And we've seen that time and again in this era under President Ramaphosa where agreements are made, he says reforms will take place, but in general, they don't then happen. Now you, 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 I notice you also say, I, somewhere else I read, that the, we've had this um, non-functioning state or really um, wrecked state for 12 years, which means you're saying that under Sir Ramaphosa with, uh, I think you, you grant him the goodwill, uh, but, but, but progress has been quite small? I think progress, it would be unfair to say there's been no progress. Is it in any way commensurate with what the country needs? No. And look at the board. We have an acting chairman and I think we have one engineer. That's a joke. So I think there have been some steps and we can talk about what the president, the current president has done. And I don't think it's nearly enough and not nearly significant enough. Um. So you, you've talked about uh, immediate reforms and, 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 and more long-term reforms. We, we need to take a break in the moment, but just to start with, what would you, what were the, uh, one of the labor reforms we, you, uh, I've uh, seen you mention is that under our labor uh, uh, agreements, trade unions are able to make, uh, to reach agreements that then apply beyond their own membership. Uh, this was a surprise for me. I mean, I'm an, an ex-union uh, president. Uh, I, I support unions, but that seems to be a, a, an undemocratic principle and, and uh, dangerous. So I'm, I'm a Democrat. I'm in favor of freedom to organize. I'm in favor of trade unions. But when you look at our current legislation, in collective bargaining, you and I could be the employer and the union negotiating what to do in this factory or in this sector where we're operating. And when we reach a deal that suits us, the minister can extend that and generally does to everybody who wasn't around that table. And this particularly affects smaller businesses, small town businesses, rural businesses, and new businesses. And so we're saying we're calling for changes to the labor market rules, but we've carefully calibrated them because we respect the achievements that have been made by the unions after many decades of struggle. And we're saying you can't upend this entire system. It's just politically not realistic. We're not sure it even would be positive for the economy, but what you have to do is you've got to open the door to all these millions and millions of people who are unemployed and would work for lower wages and, you know, you need to enforce basic standards, but um, not the kind of higher standards that have been achieved through the unions. We need to do that. And we've got to stop just talking about small business and how we love small business, but actually the numbers are declining pre-COVID. We have to understand that wages affect employment and they affect the space, the costs of doing business in South Africa, especially for new small firms and informal firms. We need to take a break. We'll be right back with Anne Bernstein. Um, and we're back talking to Anne Bernstein, Executive Director of the Centre for Development and Enterprise. Anne, um, before we leave Labour, are there any other Labour reforms you're looking for that you think would kickstart uh, growth and, and job creation? Yes, there are. Um, one we've emphasised in particular is comes from the recommendations of the Harvard Group in the late 2000s, advising the government at that time, where they essentially were arguing for what we have, an expanded tax incentive for new young employees. We support that. 
Uh, but we would also say you need to look at the hiring and firing issue. You know, you've got to make the environment more inducive for employers who want to hire young people. Inexperience never worked a risk for employers. So we've got to look at both the wage, but also can I take a risk on you? And if you don't work out, we can get rid of you easily. So the costs of that need to be looked at and the rules and regulations. There are a number of other recommendations we've made in our major report on jobs in January this year, in terms of the CCMA and other kinds of issues. So we do have some carefully selected reforms that we think would make it easier to become a more labor intensive kind of economy. Now, you also talked about infrastructure, and it strikes me, um, you know, the, South Africa is not the only country that seems to be messing up its, its infrastructure advancement. I know in the United States, it's quite extraordinary how infrastructure has not kept up with, uh, with, uh, uh, with global needs and, and American needs. What, when you say you want to see infrastructure, you've also said it's got to be the kind of infrastructure that is... Uh, that, that pay, pays for itself in the long term. What does that mean? What would, you, what would an infrastructure plan uh, be like that you would like to see implemented? Well, let's start at the beginning. Most of the recovery strategies, if not all of them that are on the table, see infrastructure as a key sort of pillar of how South Africa can move forward. And we're not opposed to that, but we're saying there are a lot of questions here. We've spent a lot of money on infrastructure in the last sort of period, which has not worked very well. From Madupi, for example, a key cause of ESCOM's massive debt, um, and not clear how that's going to be repaid. You know, think of um, train coaches that are too the wrong size for South Africa, and so on and so forth. So. I think infrastructure is not a silver bullet. Remember Obama talked about having shovel-ready projects after the 2008 financial crisis, and years later, it turned out they weren't really shovel-ready. So there's a lot of hype around the infrastructure. Of course, we need better ports. We need much better urban you know, train transport in our cities. It's criminal what's been allowed to happen there. So, we, you know, you and I could come up with a long list of what we need to fix in terms of infrastructure. But we are saying there's some important questions that need to be dealt with if South Africa is to take loans in order to, to invest in a lot more infrastructure. So the government's got minuscule amounts of money to invest in infrastructure. So it's going to be domestic and international funding. And the more international funding we get, the more risky it is, you've got to pay it back. So we've got to make sure that the infrastructure we put the money into delivers returns in terms of the economy as a whole and can be paid for. So we're asking a few questions really, which is what kind of infrastructure are we going to prioritize? There are all sorts of lists in the recovery documents from more schools to social infrastructure to economic infrastructure. And then what kind of economic infrastructure? I, for one, am totally opposed to a new smart city. I think it would be a, a diversion, the wrong priority altogether. But there are many other issues. So we've got to ask those questions. And then we have to ask, we've been talking like this about infrastructure for decades. What has to change to incentivize the private sector to come to the party with, with considerable financing and capacity. It's, these are not simple issues. We've got it wrong in the past. And who will do the contracting when our state is um, as weak and corrupt as it is? So we're really saying, be careful. There are a lot of tough issues here. We need to wrestle with those and resolve them in the right way before we commit the country to lots and lots of money 
that just adds to our fiscal crisis. Would an example of the right way, you talked about ports and, and, and rail, rail uh, carriage, uh, that seems to be potentially a really good example of something we could do, but of course, would you be saying it's got to be linked to what's going to go on those uh, on uh, into those ports and onto those rail? In other words, if our mining sector is declining at the same time, that's something that has to be integrated into the plan. Look, we know we know that mining today, at its you know not ideal capacity, if you if you know what I mean, and yet it has been in decline. The mining sector today is saying we need more capacity, we need better, more efficient ports. The agricultural sector, I was recently talking to the Western Cape government and they were saying that they get pleas from the agricultural sector that have markets overseas, but they can't get the product through the ports quickly enough. So even today with the economy in as bad a state as it is, our infrastructure key parts of the infrastructure aren't performing sufficiently for, for what we can deliver. Um, and as the economy hopefully starts to pick up, that will increase. So again, you know, we've got to say exports really important, balance of payments, all sorts of jobs involved, helps with the fiscal crisis, that's obviously a top priority. A second priority is, and we've done a lot of work on this, how we make our cities, which are one of South Africa's advantages as a developing country, how we make them much more efficient for doing business and for unemployed people to get to jobs. So it's how we connect, the interconnections in the city are absolutely vital and the collapse of urban public transport is just, well the fact that no no politician, nobody has ever taken responsibility, you know, whether it's the SOE or a politician for this unbelievable situation it is devastating. And, and it's, a, it's a really important illustration of a top priority. What could be more important than workers being able to use public transport that's subsidized to get to work? And this is collapsing all over our metros um, because we weren't sort of all sorts of reasons, but no one takes accountability and we just pretend, oh, well, somehow we'll fix it. I don't believe that. Uh, we need to see very concrete, compelling arguments of what's gone wrong, why it happened, and what we're going to do that's really different. So, so that the whole infrastructure issue is not a way to avoid South Africa's big choices. And I sometimes feel people use that umbrella to say, well, we're all in favor of this, let's move on. It it's embodies a lot of our big choices about the future of state-owned enterprises, who we appoint to what positions of seniority and what criteria. And so I'm very much in favor of looking at sectors of the economy, say transport, how best do we manage that in South Africa today? Where is the capacity? It's not some ideological issue. It's where is the capacity in our society? What can be done? And boy, what has to change from the mess up that we've created up to now in many areas? Thank you. We need to take one more break um, and we'll be back with Anne Bernstein. <music> And we're back on the forum with Anne Bernstein, uh, Executive Director of the Centre for Development and Enterprise. And uh, before we go of cities, uh, since we're in Cape Town, I just wanted to mention one thing I'm sure you know uh, a lot about. We have a number of large uh, tracts of land here owned by the military and others that have never been freed, that are not in use, but have never been freed up and would, would, would help solve our, our tremendous and growing residency problem. Sonia, I'm pleased you mentioned that. This is a really important issue. So the discussion about urban land and urban land reform is, I think, one that we need much more attention to. Um, think about, you know, the cities are so important for our economy. 
nearly 70% of the population live in our cities and the vast majority of our economic activity takes place in the city. So how we manage these cities to become cities of hope and expanding opportunity for everyone is absolutely critical. The state land in metropolitan areas and SOE land, like in Durban, there's a lot of land that's available that should be brought into use exactly what use it should be put to, you know, needs to be part of the city's economic planning. Um, but I can't agree more. I think there are pockets of land in our metros, for example, that could be used much more efficiently. And we need to think differently. You know, too much attention is put to rural land reform, which is essential. I wish we could do it properly, and we've done a lot of work on that in the past. But how we make our cities work better for poorer South Africans and poorer residents deserves much more attention. And that requires more focus on who's running our cities, what kind of skills they have, what sort of powers they need, where do we devolve powers to metros with capacity, um, and then what is the land and housing strategy that builds on private sector expertise and capacity that builds on individual. Um, you know, the interesting thing about what we were talking about before on smaller, you know, a man buying a house and then turning it into a kind of rental enterprise, they're funding it themselves or from the private sector. They don't need a subsidy from government but they do need the metro to be able to respond to increased density and the need for services to provide for an increasing population. Yes, uh, just before we, we go off Cape Town, I mean, um, on this uh, station I interviewed Patricia DeLille when she was mayor of Cape Town about the fact that there were these really large tracts of land that uh, belonged to government and she couldn't get freed up. And then when she became the minister, we thought she'd be able to free it up. But it turns out that the, the, the military won't allow, provide the land because they want the city to pay them something like a billion rand for it. And so then the, the discussions break down and government never gets fought past that. Well, that's one of the topics I would like to talk about, if it's all right with you, is how to think about reform and in a society like this. And this is a topic which is absolutely vital for South Africa and really re relevant to assessing the president's tenure so far. So reformers need a game plan. They need to understand the realities of the situation they're dealing with and there's certainly no doubt that President Ramaphosa has been dealt a difficult hand, um, although he's been part of the ANC for all this time, so he's been part of creating this situation, but it's a difficult situation without doubt. Reformers need to then prioritize. You need to say, I don't know, I'd have cities as one of my priorities, but you, you know, energy, whatever your priorities are, but have them and then stick with them. And you need a team around the president saying, gee, we've got a really weak state, but we have capacity in this metro or that metro or in the private sector. How do we mobilize that capacity while we rebuild the state? And, you know, it's, it's insane that we don't, we haven't resolved the situation you talk about where the defense force says you've got to pay us for the land and the Metro saying, you know, we can only pay for this or we don't think that's appropriate. Resolve the issue. What's more important? So I think we, we're a country adrift at the moment at every level where the cabinets, you know, one cabinet minister wants to cut the budget and I support him. Another cabinet minister wants to introduce a basic income grant for everybody or the national health insurance or you know, wants to fund the SAA. So we don't have a coherent view of these are our priorities as a society. This is what we're going to try and achieve. We know the state has all sorts of problems. 
this is the capacity we're going to use in the meanwhile to get things going and these are the mechanisms. I just don't feel we have that and it, it starts with reformers need a game plan. They need to know what they're go doing. They need a narrative to provide hope and direction. And I think we're just failing on so many fronts in, in those respects. But we have uh, 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 groups ostensibly doing these things, the National Planning Commission, NEDLAC. What goes wrong? Well, these are very different entities. I think that I am not a NEDLAC fan. Um, NEDLAC is something that arose out of our transition when we didn't have a democratic government and it sort of then extended its life. Who's around the table? Let's come back to labor regulations and reform. Who's around the table at NEDLAC? You've got big government, you've got big business, incumbent business, if you like, and you've got some of the trade unions, all right? It's more complicated now because the trade unions have split up. Who's not there? Well, the unemployed aren't represented and small business is only recently there in a quite a small way. So I, I think that it's complicated that we keep saying, the president keeps saying, I want the so-called social partners to, to find a you know, find each other. You get a lowest common denominator sort of approach, and I'm opposed to this endless reliance on compacts. I'm in favor of leadership, and compacts are not a replacement for leadership. You can use collaboration and compacts to, to kind of push the leadership direction that you want, but I don't think that's the way to go about the way that we're currently talking about this doesn't work and i see nedlac which does have some useful functions getting certain people together and so on but i'm much more in favor of parliament i want to strengthen parliament because after all who elected nedlac so you know so i'm in favor of parliament and in a sense i'm not saying there's no role for a body like nedlac but i think it's pretty complicated and we need to understand that and i'm opposed to continual discussions and endless finding each other when actually what we need is to break out we need leadership to help us build a new political coalition for a set of new priorities for the country so the National Planning Commission, a whole different thing. I think it's got a lot more life at the moment. They're doing some interesting research. It's not very clear to me what impact they've had up till now, um, maybe in the future. I'm not sure. My understanding from talking to people on it is that they also had the problem. They started with a manageable number of priorities, but the number of priorities mushroomed to the point that it was just a Christmas tree. Um, I, I want to, uh, we, we're running out of time and I wanted to go through a couple of things. First of all, uh, briefly, uh, you say you'd like to see Parliament more powerfully, so, more powerful, so would I. Um, but it's not working too well. How would, how would you reform Parliament? Look, I'm not, you know, there are a range of issues here, Johnny. Um, I'm not, this is something I haven't put a lot of attention to recently. I'm not in favor of our current electoral system. No. I'm a big fan of constituency representation and some sort of mixed system as simple as possible definitely seems a much better route for South Africa. Um, so that would be one issue. I was listening to Trevor Manuel recently who had some very clear proposals on how to increase the accountability function of parliament. And I think that's, you know, somebody has to hold the executive accountable, that isn't happening very well at all. No. And we need to look at how we can do that in a much better way. But I want parliament to be much more responsive to voters. And if we had more constituency representatives, lawmakers in parliament, the MPs would have to go back to their constituency and either account for legislation they've passed or test their views before they vote so that there would be a much more direct link. And I think that's a real 
problem. We know why it's arisen, but that's been a real problem of our constitution. And I think much more attention to strengthening parliament would be a really worthwhile exercise over the next, you know, as soon as possible, but over the next period. We have only 60 seconds left, and I had a lot more questions, but so I'll, I'll, I'll reduce it to one, which is you've also said that business needs to uh, uh, play a, a bigger role and provide more leadership than it has up to now. This is a big topic to summarize in 60 seconds. Let me say this. I think this is a area. I don't think business should be the cheerleader for the president, I think they need to be putting much more pressure on, on the government for the reforms that are required. So I would, I think that depending what happens tomorrow in the next few days, I'm looking for a much more strategic approach from business. I think that you have to distinguish between organized business and kind of the captains of industry, if you like. There are a whole lot of issues. I can't answer this in 60 seconds, um, but I think it's a really important issue. I think that business mobilized fantastically in response to COVID-19. They've done a lot of work. They've mobilized money and capacity and all sorts of things to help the country. Have they made sure that their proposals for growth are not just one of many, but are the only proposals on the table that could result in increased investment, not in my view sufficiently enough, and are they being strategic enough and are they compromising too much in order to all do this together and we all believe in this, that and the next thing. So we're going to see in the next few weeks to starting tomorrow if that strategy worked or if different strategies are required. Um, you, you've raised, uh, as you say, more questions uh, that I'd love to, love to have you answer. We'll have to get you back. But for the moment, thank you, Anne Bernstein, uh, Executive Director of the Centre for Development and Enterprise. Uh, we'll be right back with Patrick Turek Mellet, author of The Lie of 1652. <music> And we're back talking to Patrick Tarek Mellet, uh, the author of The Lie of 1652. Patrick, very warm, wel warm welcome to the forum. Uh, good evening, uh, John. I'm happy to be here and happy to be speak speaking to your audience. Now, uh, Patrick, you're a member of the Governance Council on Heritage Resources. You've been working on heritage all your life. Uh, you studied abroad. Um, you've just done this book, The Lie of 1652. I must tell you, I found it fascinating. We're only going to be able to touch on some of the issues here. People will have to buy the book. But I was first of all fascinated of thinking about Cape Town before 1652. I hadn't really thought about it because we all taught in school that Cape Town started with Jan van Riebeck. But um, um, it seems to me that for the, I, for, can you just tell us it was a thriving port uh, it had tra a trading, trade, local traders, and even enough of a military to give an important European commander a good hiding. Yeah, look, the, you know, my sort of epiphany moment about that was I was reading a maritime history book, uh, which is a lot more honest, I suppose, than your social history books. Oh. And up until then, I had, you know, Richard Alphick's book, you know, the Koi Koi and the founding of white South Africa spoke of 42 ships coming in between 1600 and 1652. And suddenly I was confronted with 1,071 ships, you know, and the records thereof. Wow. Um, only on the outward bound journeys, another 800 on the homeward bound journeys. And when I started doing the math, um, we were talking about about 120,000 travelers coming through Table Bay and staying for periods, anything from three weeks to nine months. That immediately altered the entire environment that we're talking about. Right. And, uh, and then, of course, the London... Had, uh, by Corey, we went to London in 1613 and Achimau went to Java in 1630. So that again changes the notion of a dirty beach bum who's ignorant, a stunt loper. But what was the life in in Cape Town, what is now Cape Town, 
during that time, what were the locals' lives like? Look, there, there were traditional Khoi groups, the Khorokhokwa and the Khorokhokwa. Um, but once the travel came along, people broke away from those traditional groups to form a trading community, which were the Amakwa, or what the Dutch called the um, the water people. Namely, they'd settled themselves down next to the Camiso River banks, and they were meeting the needs. Now, for instance, before that, uh, Khoi people weren't making salt, but because the ships needed salt, they started salt production. Um, they were obviously also, uh, you know, servicing the ships with water from the Kamisa. Um, they were middlemen trading cattle, meat, etc. They were helping with field, field hospitals that had been established for the sick. Um, two groups in, in, in uh, 1644, 390 shipwreck survivors stayed there in Table Bay for four months. Um, in 1647, for nine months, 90 survivors stayed there. So they, was, they were very used to Europeans, and they were used to, besides Europeans on those ships, they were Arabs, Africans, they were Southeast Asians working as ship crews. They, they were used to the outside world long before Van Rivi came there. Yeah. Was, it, was it a stable local community? Absolutely. The, the two main groups um, followed a sort of transhuman um, pattern of moving their cattle about for grazing purposes, but they only went up as far as Mar Marmersbury in the winter months and then down back into Cape Town in the summer months. But the trading community stayed there all the time. And in fact, the British referred to Achamara or Harry as the governor at the Cape. And whenever he went to meet European ships, he wore European clothes because he understood power dressing, that if he was going to do the, the best of deals, that he would go there and, you know, meet people on their same terms. So we have a very different picture that comes across of Cape Town than the one we've given. You know, we got that Charles Bell picture of Van Rivik with the flag and the soldiers and uh, then the Khoi standing in front like in awe that this is the first time they're meeting Europeans. Right. And it's a complete... Nonsense, it's a fiction. Fantasy. Now, you, you also uh, read uh, everything you could about Jan van Riebeck. And uh, before Jan van Riebeck was appointed, they, they offered the post to, to a somewhat nicer person who turned it down. And Jan van Riebeck already had a bit of a reputation. And from what you tell in your book, he was not a very nice man at all. Well, look, firstly and foremostly, he wasn't this pious <laughs> uh, character that we have painted in history. He, he lost his job with the Dutch East oh, India no. Company in Vietnam. He was a very important person in Vietnam because he, for the Dutch because he spoke <coughs> Vietnamese fluently. Um, he was sacked for insider trading, for corruption, and, um, and moved to Japan. And then from Japan, he was ordered back to the Netherlands. And on his way back, he picked up that crew of, it was a fleet of 12 ships. They picked up the crew that had been staying there for nine months. And he learned that, you know, Captain Janssens was putting in a report to the Dutch East India Company. And um, he then offered himself uh, to the Dutch East India Company after another man by the name of Pruitt uh, turned the job down. To, to start the uh, first permanent station in Cape Town for the Dutch. Yes, I mean, that's, that, that's basically what he's, you know, he wasn't the founder of the Port of Cape Town. He was the founder of colonial South Africa. Um, and and, and um, he had a formidable um, opponent in Archimara. And uh, he, in fact, writes in his, in his diary that Archimara, or Harry, as he calls him, would insist that it was he that started the trading settlement. And uh, so they contested ideas. Van Riebeek, on the one hand, says he's this beach bum, but on the other hand, he, he says he ent entertains Harry frequently over cheese and wine and bread, you know, at dinners. So there's a contradiction there. Um, and um, over a, literally an eight-year, six-year period, him and Harry go head to head. And ultimately, um, only through a divide and rule process, he manages to put uh, uh, Achimo on, on Robben Island as a prisoner and then negotiates a really one-sided deal um, through a man by the name of Doman or Noma uh, with the Hornaiko 
Port in Haikwa and the Horokopua peoples. I want to move on because you, you discovered an ancestor, um, Kratoa, uh, who, who worked in von Riebeck's uh, uh, home. Yes, I, in fact, I had a few ancestors who worked in his home. Uh, Kotoa is one of them. She's a ninth great grandmother. And, um, and then another one is Lisbeth uh, Erabas. Uh, 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 she and Cornelia Erabas were two girls, uh, 10 and 12 years old, that a French Navy captain had uh, given as a gift to Maria van Riebeek. Uh, one of those girls, Lisbeth uh, Erabas, is also a ninth great grandmother. I, I know my ancestors for the last 400 years, uh, all by name and by story. And there are 26 among them that were enslaved peoples. And there was five among them that were Khoi and 19 among them that were the base Europeans, uh, uh, first generation Europeans. Okay. So um, it, it's a, it's a, it, it was a journey in itself. <laughs> no, no, that sounds, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, now, uh, the, the, but your book travels all the way through the land uh, dispossession right through to the present. And so, because we don't have a lot of time left, I want you to know how you see the land reform debate now. I mean, the, you know, we've had this big debate about expropriation without compensation. And uh, just this week, the ANC has brought a new piece of legislation out. How do, how do you see uh, what, what the government is doing? Is it going to satisfy you? No, it's, 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 it's not. You know, let me start by saying that there were 19 wars of dispossession, which my book, you know, meticulously outlines. And that from the first war, Van Riebeek says to the Khoi people, who indicate very clearly that they understand ownership of land. And he says to them, I had to take it by the sword. So there's no dispute about the land being expropriated without compensation. Um, I think it's an unfortunate thing that we use that phraseology now, because what we are really talking about is restoration of the land that had been expropriated without compensation. The bulk of that land is going to four provinces where the ANC is having a lot of problems um, uh, around this unity. Uh, it's going to Northwest, to Mpumalanga, to KZN and to Free State. The rest of the provinces, it's negligible. Two of the provinces and zero land gain, namely the Western Cape being one of those. So what this seems to be designed to do is to placate the tension within the ANC within those provinces. And it's a kind of sop to provide land. Now, when we look at this, it's, it, it's actually a carbon copy of what the Dutch, uh, the Dutch East India Company did in the Cape. They created a system called the Yenon Plus, the loan farm or lease farm uh, 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 scenario. The, the ANC is taking exactly the same approach. This is a lease farm scenario. We have about 20, 20 seconds, so tell us the solution and we're going to have to end. They actually created 13 million farmers with land title between 1975 and now. They have a, a, they trade with us. They trade with Nigeria. They trade with Benin. Um, it's a highly successful farming economy. Also, they have less than 1% unemployment. Um, <clears throat> they, they, they came up with something called the sufficiency economic policy. Our problem is that we look to America, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the UK for our guidance, not to a country that is similar to us. And by the way, Thailand was never colonized but they had disparities based on their class system and their, their system of, of the crown and nobility. Um, uh, my wife farms, she has a farm, farm in Thailand. Um, people are very proud of their land. Most of those farms are about eight hectares in extent. Um, so they are small artisanal farms. Um, and all of those 13 million farmers employ at least one person. So, you know, we, we only employ 890,000 farm workers in South Africa. That, there is employment of 13 million farm workers. I, 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 I have to cut you off. I'm, I'm really sorry. I wish we had more time. Uh, but thanks, thanks so much. And I can only encourage people to read your book and follow up with talking to you about the solutions you propose. Uh, that was Patrick Tarek Mellet. Uh, th that's our show. Uh, thanks to the Frederick Ebert Foundation for their support. I look forward to seeing you next week for the forum. I'm John Madison.